We've got a bit to go through, so let's get started. Hello and Happy New Year! My name's Natalia, I'm a knitter based in Sydney, Australia, and as the title suggests, this is a recap of everything that I knit in 2022. So it's actually a decent mixed bag as well because I didn't just knit things for myself, I did quite a bit of gift knitting this year. So there's things for babies, for adult men, so I think there's a bit of variety and I hope there's something in here that you'll find some inspiration from. Because for me, I mean that is why I love knitting recap videos because there are so many patterns that I never would have found had I not watched someone's knitting recap. And I hope that may be the case for you too. So I think without any further ado, let's just get into everything that I knit in 2022. Before I get into it, I'll just explain kind of how I'm gonna approach this. Each garment that I show, I'll also do a try on and talk about fit and the patterns, sort of what I thought about it, if I made any modifications. I'll also put in some information at the side too that will break up things like how many sizes are available, the yarn that I used, I mean, obviously the pattern name and the designer. So if there's anything I forget to mention, it should be all there. I will also link everything below. So if there's anything I missed, let me know, but Hopefully between my own knowledge, the information I put in and the description stuff below, we should be pretty well covered. I will also say in the information how long each piece took me to complete. Now I know that's super personal and that's really gonna vary knitter by knitter. I mean, somebody who's retired and can knit for many hours a day is gonna be able to complete things faster than somebody who's, you know, working full time, looking after children and is lucky to, if you hear any banging, the cats are around, they're doing their thing. They might come and join us, we'll see. Obviously, the time to complete a project is super personal. There's so many factors that come into it, but I think it's helpful just to have a sort of general idea. Even if someone's a super fast knitter, if they complete a sweater in a week, it's probably gonna be a fairly fast knit, um, opposed to somebody who is still a fast knitter and it takes them six months to complete. It's just a nice kind of idea to sort of gauge it. I wouldn't say that I'm exceptionally fast. I also wouldn't say that I'm exceptionally slow. I've been knitting for several years. Um, I've got a decent speed. So I think um, it'll just be a nice sort of baseline. So whether you find it helpful or not, I'll put the information there anyway. But let's just get started. So the first two I actually don't even have with me. They're both gift knits. The first one was a gift knit I did for my boyfriend's father. And that was the Ranger Cardigan by Jared Flood. It's a worsted weight pattern. I believe it's knit on five millimeter needles for the body. And the yarn I used was Snelden 3-ply. I got a lot of recommendations. I didn't get a lot of her recommendations. I heard Fiber Tales talk about it a lot on her podcast. And I really like her taste in yarn, so I decided to give it a go. It is a Danish company. I believe they're based out of the Faroe Islands. And the yarn is sourced from the Falklands, but it's processed in the Faroe Islands. And to have it shipped to Australia, I think it took maybe about a month to arrive and the shipping cost, I think it was about 120 Danish krones, which I'm pretty sure works out to be about 25 Australian dollars, which I think is pretty reasonable to have something shipped from the other side of the world uh, to you. <laughs> and the yarn itself is also incredibly affordable. So, oh dear, just watching cats do things that they shouldn't do. Anyway. So I was really happy with that, with that price. And the quality is beautiful. It's very rustic. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's exceptionally toothy. If you're quite sensitive, you probably need to lay it with something else, but it's super warm, very woolly. I believe it's maybe even woolen spun, um, but I could be wrong on that one. I found the pattern really enjoyable to knit. Something interesting I found was that as I was knitting it, I had a lot of concerns about the sizing. For instance, the arms were the main things I was really worried about. When I was knitting them, I got him to try them on because you knit them from the cuff up. The entire sweater is knit from the bottom up. And when he was trying the sleeves on, they were skin tight, zero ease, maybe even negative ease. And I was really worried because that's really not the look that I think he wanted or that generally you're going for in a kind of more oversized menswear cardigan. But something happened magically that once the sleeves were joined to the body and I blocked it, they fit perfectly. And I don't think it was a blocking process that stretched them out. There was something, I don't know, about the weight of the garment and maybe just how the sleeves fit. I don't know what happened, but it all worked out really well in the end. The only thing with that um, is that the yarn itself was quite heavy, which is why I was wondering if it actually was wool and spun or not. But because of that weight of it and it was knitted from the bottom up, 
when I got, when I had, you know, knit to the underarms, it was a really good length and then I was really happy with it. You know, I then knit the yoke, joined the sleeves in, did the button band and the collar and everything. And once it had all come together, the sheer weight of everything had dragged the cardigan down, which as a result probably lengthened it by maybe about an inch or two. And once again, that wasn't to do with the blocking process. This happened pre-blocking. It didn't grow too much in the blocking process um, because once again, it was pure wool. It's not super wash, but yeah, that's probably one thing that I would have liked to be a little bit different. If I just knit it maybe an inch shorter, I think would have been perfect. But he was happy with the length. It looks really, really good on. He's gotten a lot of wear out of it. So I'd really recommend this pattern. I also really like the stitch that they used. It's, I believe, sort of like a broken rib or something to that sort of extent. And what I liked about it is that it was monotonous enough that you could just sort of memorize it, but also there was enough variety that it was engaging because I personally do not love stocking it in the round. Endless stocking it in the round, I just find really, really demotivating. And I know some people love it and they find it really almost like meditative to be doing just endless stocking it in the round, but I find it kind of like brain atrophying and I can't handle it. Which is funny because the next sweater I'm gonna talk about was a lot of stocking it in the round, but it was color work. So I think that gives that sort of engagement that I really need in projects to stay super motivated and really stay in love with them. So the next pattern I'll talk about was the Setter Style Sweater by Anna and Carlos. And that was a gift knit I did for my father. I knit it in Raumagan Finnel and that was the recommended yarn to use for it. It's a Norwegian yarn, uh, it's fingering weight, two ply. And while it's rustic, I still found it quite soft. I think for people who once again, if you're super sensitive, it's probably not going to agree with you very well, but I was surprised for a natural yarn how soft it was without being excessively scratchy or toothy or anything like that. It was also perfect for it because this garment does require steaking. You need to steak open armholes and you need to cut um, the collar out as well. And because it has more of that sort of rustic component, it really wants to hold itself together really well. And this was my first ever steaked garment. And I think that choice of yarn made it a really positive experience. And I love steaking now. I would steak anything, give it to me, love it. So I think yarn choice plays a big part of that. This piece was a slog to knit, but it was also a joy to knit. So as I mentioned, it's knit on fingering with fingering weight yarn and the body's knit on three millimeter needles, which is, quite fine needles and quite fine yarn for a men's sweater. So it did take me several months to knit. And I did find that the color work leading up to the chest, I found it a little bit challenging in the sense of, I found it really boring and it was hard to stay motivated because while there was the little like dots, the little lopey throughout it, which were good to sort of give a little bit of variety, it wasn't quite enough. However, once I hit that color work section, section across the sort of yoke chest, that flew by. It was so much fun. It was pretty easy to memorize as well. The shapes were quite simple. So I found I wasn't having to look at the chart all the time. The pattern itself was really straightforward, really easy to follow. However, the only thing is once it came to that sticking component of assembling the arms and creating the collar and doing all that, it was very minimal in its instructions. It pretty much always said, now steak. Um, now combine, sew this in. And there was no instructions as to how to do that. But I mean, YouTube to the rescue, I did quite a bit of research and found some really good tutorials. I'll link them below. But from that, I also created my own sort of tutorial vlog walkthrough of what I did. It's not really necessarily a, it, it does go step by step, but it's definitely more geared towards intermediate to advanced knitters who know all the techniques, they just need to know how to use them. So for instance, I might talk about, you know, you need to do the mattress stitch to, to seam this together. And I don't show you how to do the mattress stitch or explain what that is. So it's maybe not the most comprehensive resource, but I don't know, I hope you find it helpful. I know some people have seeing someone actually do it from start to finish. All the ones on YouTube I found tend to be sections of it. So for instance, how to create the collar or then how to do the arms. And there was never anything that combined all those pieces together. So I'll link that somewhere around here if you're interested. But 
Aside from that, the only other issue I encountered with this, and I don't know if that's just something that I did or kind of what went wrong with it, but I found the yarn estimates that were given in the pattern didn't actually reflect the yarn that I used in it. So the size I knit, I believe, was like a medium large, and from memory, the yardage required was maybe, it worked out to be about seven balls for the main color of the Raumagan, and a bit over three for the, I think it was a bit over three, or maybe at the high end of like getting to almost three balls of the contrast color. And I ordered this yarn from Canada, from Wall of Yarn, which I'd also really highly recommend. Shipping was super fast. I think it arrived within a week and only cost about 23 Canadian dollars, which at the time was pretty much exactly the same as, you, as Australian. So I paid about 23 Australian dollars. And because I couldn't get the yarn locally. So, and because I couldn't get the yarn locally, I wanted to be sort of prudent and order a little bit more than I, than the pattern suggested. So I ordered eight balls of the main color and four balls of the contrast color, just so I had that extra buffer in case I used more yardage than the pattern had me, had me use. Which was, thankfully I had done that because I ended up using more than eight balls of the main color. Luckily I had a sock yarn in my stash that almost perfectly matched the same shade of navy um, as the Raoul Magan. So I was able to use that for just very last sections of it. I think I ended up using it just for the collar. Thankfully, I think I'd used all the main color for the body and the sleeves and everything. And I just needed it for the folded collar and I used the sock yarn for that. But then for the contrast color, I ended up using, maybe it was like just over two balls. It was a lot less than I was expecting to use of the contrast color. So I don't know how that works out, but that was my yardage experience that I had. So maybe, I don't know if you're going to knit this, which I do recommend. It was a beautiful pattern. I think it turned out wonderfully, but maybe just kind of take the yardage recommendations with a grain of salt. So the next category I'll talk about is cardigans. The first piece I'll speak about is the Stonecrop cardigan by Andrea Mary. And this was such a joy to knit. I had shown it a little bit on my channel um, when I was sort of in the early stages of it. And looking at the notes, it said it took me four months to complete it, which I found really hard to believe because it felt like it also just went by in a flash because it was such a joy to knit. However, I think there was some times where I had to put it on hiatus and if that affected the time, I'm not sure. I don't think it would take you four months to knit this, but it was an absolute joy. It is using finer yarn. So I use the Lanagato VIP, which is a fingering weight 80-20 uh, blend of wool and cashmere. And then for the contrast color, I used Spin Cycles Dyed in the Wool in their Mississippi Masala colorway. I did have to size down with my needles. I think the pattern recommended using a 3.75 and I had to size down to 2.75. That was solely because of the Lanagato VIP. It's fingering weight, but it's very, very fine, maybe even a light fingering. So I did have to size down quite a bit to accommodate that. So as I've mentioned with this pattern, it truly was such a joy to knit. I would really highly recommend it. The color work was pretty engaging. It was still simple and it was repetitive enough that it was really easy to memorize when you got to those sections. You didn't have to carry floats very far. I really enjoyed it. However, there was a few issues I encountered. The first one was a fit issue. There was something funny about the yoke where I think it was too deep and then also maybe not wide enough. Whatever the issue was, something was happening where it was kind of wanting to bunch up on my shoulders around here and it would sort of cause all the fabric to want to go up and it just didn't look quite right. And that was exacerbated when I blocked it because the yarn was so silky and there was super wash, it grew and it grew a lot. I would say probably at least two sizes, which I was not anticipating because I don't knit with superwash. I almost always knit with natural non-superwash yarns. So I wasn't prepared for just the amount of growth that would come. And I know people say that superwash does grow. I didn't think it would be that much. And so because it grew these two sizes, I was sort of in this like <laughs> fit of rage and just thought, all right, if you're so superwash, I'm just gonna put you in the washer and hope that maybe you'll just fill just that little, little bit so that maybe you'll fit me a bit better. But what I pulled out of the washer was not a slightly felted garment. It hadn't shrunk a little bit. It can now fit a baby. I, I couldn't believe it. And it's, it's so, I mean, a baby wouldn't wear this. It's like knitted Kevlar. Like this is, oh, it's really felted. But 
from this, I realized it actually wasn't super washable. Well, the spin cycle super wash, but the Lana Gato isn't. The reason it grew so much was just because of that cashmere content. It was just so silky and drapey that it grew with the blocking. Cause I've never knit with yarn that was that soft before. Cause it was, it was like a cloud. It was heavenly, but I wasn't prepared once again for just the amount of growth that came with it. But it's interesting to see because you can see the Lana Gato, how it's really felted. But with the spin cycle, because it is superwash, you can still kind of see that stitch definition. Maybe not in some places, but like there's some way it's just like, that's clearly still held its shape. So that was in the wash. It was still on a gentle cycle, but it was in there for three hours on eco at 40 degrees. It was not my smartest move, but there's something kind of endearing about this. I never would have thought that knitwear could shrink this much, but it can. So it hasn't put me off knitting another one because I did love this pattern. I'm heartbroken that I lost a skein of spin cycle that I can't harvest, <laughs> but I would love to knit another one. This hasn't put me off. It was really enjoyable to knit. My only concern is that issue with the yoke. And I don't know if other people had that issue um, I didn't really look at the projects in Ravelry to see if anyone had comments about it, but that is one thing I'd keep in mind. My only other um, issue I had with the pattern was the steak. Because I had such a positive experience with the Setter Style sweater, I kind of went in a little bit cocky and I, I just thought I had it down. And I didn't factor in how different the yarn is and in the pattern, Andrea Mary has you have, I think it's about a five column, it's five stitch wide steak column down the middle, but she only has you reinforce either side of one stitch. So she's having you cut up one stitch to create that steak. And I think with super wash yarn, you want more than that because the second that I cut through it, it instantly unraveled. It didn't hold itself together whatsoever. So I think it's a bit of a risk having it so such a narrow steak. I mean, the easiest way around that would just be choosing a different yarn choice. And I think that's what I would do if I was to knit this again. I would not use anything super silky. I think for any color work, especially, not necessarily any color work, any color work I'm staking, I'm gonna be using a natural wool. I'm not gonna be using anything that's too silky and certainly no super wash. But despite all those little obstacles, I love it. I still love it. It was a really fun pattern and I'd really highly recommend it. And it's kind of, really made me interested in knitting more Andrea Mary patterns just because they are so easy to knit and um, so clear and I really really love her pattern writing skills. So that was my my stone crop. Now the next couple of cardigans were actually all test knits that I did. The first one is the Priscilla cardigan by Majin Makawacek and it is this beautiful light blue all over lace cardigan. It's got quite a deep V and the edging of it is sort of this almost like scalloped edging and it's slightly cropped. Uh, mine ended up not being quite as cropped as I would like. I do tend to like really, really cropped pieces, but this one, if I put it on, so this one is knit with a fingering weight and a mohair held together. You can just substitute it as just a pure DK. So for mine, I use the Bendigo Woolen Mills Tranquility, which is a, I think it's maybe 70, 50, I'm actually not sure what the blend is. I'm not sure what the breakup is, but it's wool, silk, and nylon. And it is stunning. And I held it with the Biche Bush Le Petit Mohair and Silk, which was in the light blue colorway. And as I mentioned previously with the stone crop pullover, a cardigan, sorry, I don't use superwash, but this yarn is a superwash. However, the mohair really helps it hold its shape so it doesn't grow too much. This did grow somewhat in the blocking process, but also with lace, you are kind of intentionally doing that because you do want to open it up so you can really see those patterns. I've had so many compliments on this. When I was knitting it, I also had a lot of people lean over my shoulder and ask what I was knitting. It's beautiful. It is a beast to knit though. I mean, with that said, I still knit it in a month. I was knitting pretty much exclusively just on this in that time, but it's a lot because it's all over color work, <laughs> color work, sorry, it's all over lace. So you're knitting the lace back and front. 
It also comes with three different charts. So you can see here, you've got that sort of like zigzag one here. Then you've got these things that almost remind me of like sweet peas, but with the little, um, noops, little bobbles. And then in between that, that little S shape, you've got the cable. So three different charts to look from, and they were three different row repeats. So what I mean by that is the little S-shaped cable was only a six row repeat. The little crisscrossy one, I believe was a 12 row repeat. And then the baubles here were a 24 row repeat. So it was kind of hard to keep a track of where you were at with each one. And at the time of testing, each of the charts was done separately. They weren't combined together. And that just did my head in. I couldn't handle all looking at where I was between each of the charts, especially once you get further down the pattern and once you're at row, f you know, 43, where are you in each of those ones? So because there was the three different charts and they weren't combined together, I just took it upon myself to do a really shoddy Photoshop job and just put them all together. So they combined into one chart that showed a 24 row repeat. And that just made my life so much easier. So I haven't seen the release pattern of this. Hopefully she's included it in that because I think not just myself, but I think other testers also found that really, really helpful. As I've mentioned, it is stunning. It's beautiful on, it just looks absolutely gorgeous. But beware, I would only recommend doing this if you are at least an intermediate knitter and certainly only if you love lace. If you don't love lace, I don't think this is gonna be worth the time that goes into it because it's a lot. As I mentioned, it's knit lace both on the wrong and right sides. There's no respite. Um, I do enjoy lace and even for me, it was quite a lot. And if I can show you that beautiful little sculpt edge, it's not being blocked as aggressively probably as it should be, but you can sort of see here, that sort of sculpt edging. The next cardigan was once again another test knit. I did this one for Ocean Knits and it's the Mohair Intentions cardigan. This one is also a lacy cardigan. Really, really cute, same repetition. I can't remember what you call this lace pattern. I will put it across here, <laughs> whatever you call this. Fish tail, something like that, maybe? I'm not super familiar with all the different names of, um, of laced patterns, but just a simple, I think it's an eight row or six, six, six row repeat for it. It's eight stitches across in a six row repeat. And this one, it was knit on six millimeter needles and took me two weeks to knit. And the nice thing with this is it's knit lace on the right side and the wrong side is just pearl stitches from memory. So it's nice to have that bit of a break um, from the lace with just a simple pearl to kind of give your mind a bit of a, bit of a break. And this pattern was super well written, really, really clear. And I think it's a really cute piece. For me, it's maybe a little more oversized than kind of what I would normally wear, but it's very cute. I love her pieces are sort of like really trendy while also being kind of timeless, like trendy, but without feeling like they've, they're gonna be dated in like a few months. And this one I think would make an amazing gift knit because once again, it's just knit so quickly. For the yarn, I used Rowan, oh, Rowan Tweed Haze, which is a worsted weight mohair. It's a blend. It's got mohair, alpaca, wool. I can't remember the exact composition. I will put it here somewhere. However, because of those tweed flecks, the only thing I found that when, when I was knitting it, occasionally the tweed fleck would kind of get caught while I was knitting. The weird thing was I found it happened so much when I was knitting my swatch, but then when I actually came to knit the garment, it happened far less. And I don't know why that would be if something happened in the way that I was holding the yarn or something like that. But that was one thing that I did find a little annoying with the yarn is that it did slow me down because it was catching and I had to kind of pull it through but not be too aggressive and blah, blah, blah. The original pattern was knit with uh, We Are Knitters, I think it's called Take Care Mohair, which is once again a 10 ply, like worsted Aran um, mohair, but you could also hold, I think, three strands of lace weight 
silk and mohair together to get the same gauge. And that's what several of the knitters did in the test, um, testers did, and I think their definition turned out a lot better. That is the only thing with this yarn is I think it's so floofy that you kind of do lose a bit of that definition, which is a shame because it's such a beautiful lace pattern. But I do really love the color. I really love this sort of like dusty blue. The colorway I used was uh, Rainy, which I think is number 552. So really lovely. I think it's, it's a really cute yarn um, and the pattern was just so much fun to knit and I'd really recommend it. So also super size inclusive. I believe she has 10 sizes in this, which go from a 26 inch bust all the way up to 68. So this is really to fit absolutely anybody, which I think is fantastic. The next cardigan I knit, I also don't have with me, it was a gift knit. So when I went to Europe in the middle of last year, a friend of mine had just had her, her first baby. So I knit a, a little kind of cardigan for him and it was sort of like a sailor inspired cardigan. We had navy and white stripes with these little like gold buttons on it um, that had anchors on it. I don't know why I went for that. It's not like she's a really nautical person, but there was just something that seemed, I don't know, really cute about a baby in like a fisherman jacket. And the pattern I used was the Baby Sophisticat, which was by Linden Down. It's a free pattern on Ravelry. So I can't remember the exact weight of yarn that the pattern calls for, but I used DK. I used a superwash. Once again, I've said a few times how I don't like using superwash and then here I am using superwash. The reason for that is it was a gift knit for a friend, um, as I mentioned, and because it's for a baby, you know, newborn parents are probably very sleep deprived. I want something easy to care for that if the baby, you know, spits up on it, it's gonna be easy to clean. You don't have to worry about hand washing it. So that seemed like the best option for me. It was a very quick knit. I don't remember how long it took me, maybe about a week. I mean, it was tiny. It was knit on four, mil four millimeter needles. The size in it was, I believe, for zero to three months, knowing that it would probably be a bit oversized. Um, from memory, something around, I think people were mentioning that in the pattern that it kind of knit up quite large. Um, so, and because I visited Europe in summer, he was only, had very recently been born. I think maybe it was like a week before I arrived, he was born. I knew he wouldn't be wearing it for several months to come. So I did knit it larger so that he would be ready for him to wear in winter. But yeah, I mean, I would really recommend this pattern. It was very easy to follow. It was free. I, yeah, that was it. The next piece I'll talk about is a dress. And it's a test knit that I did for Fable Knitwear. The piece is for her in her Academia collection, it's the Academia dress. At the time of recording, it hasn't been published. So I'll have to check with her ahead of time if this is all right to show. But it is this beautiful DK uh, weight, full length dress. I obviously can't show the whole thing in here, but I'll obviously show the try on where you can see it in its full, full glory but it is a DK weight dress. It's knit on four and a half millimeter needles and it took me a month to knit and that was knitting on it pretty much exclusively. I found it went by really quickly. It was, I've said everything's a joy to knit, but this was a true joy to knit. I think it is the best fitting piece that I've ever made. I just want, I just want it in so many colors and I want it, I just wanna wear it all the time, but I'm in Australia. <laughs> And it's a woolen dress so I'm pretty limited but it is stunning her pattern skills are in a league of their own just the fit of the shoulder and the chest and oh I did my own modifications on the waist I did some pretty aggressive waist shaping I know how to best show that but I did waist shaping and then pulled it out again for the hip as well. So I did hip and waist shaping to create a really um, dramatic kind of hourglass shape with it. I also, the other modification I made was I did a central slit down the um, front of one of the legs in the original pattern. The slits are at either side of the legs sort of by the calves, but I just did one center slit. Oh, I forgot to mention, the yarn is Bendigo Woolen Mills. It's in their luxury yarn, which is 100% uh, wool. I believe Superwash, um, although I feel like this one doesn't, didn't grow too much after I blocked it. Speaking of which, Bendigo Woolen Mills, I will need to check if they ship internationally, because if they do, they are a hidden secret that everybody needs to get on. So their yarns are so affordable, beautiful quality, and just, just amazing. So they sell them in 200 gram cakes, 
and that costs per 200 grams is generally on average about 16 Australian dollars, which I think at the current exchange rate is what, 10 US dollars for 200 grams of pure wool. It's amazing. I will check if they ship internationally. I will let you know. Um, but within Australia, I think it's free shipping over $60 or something like that. I mean, a knitter's dream. They are incredible. And um, I really like, I really like the color of this. It's truffle and it's sort of this like, it's a mauvey brown and it's just beautiful. So to go back to the dress, it's a mock neck sort of turtleneck sort of length up here with these really dramatic puff shoulders. And in the pattern, you can either choose to have waist shaping or to have it just go sort of straight down. I did waist shaping. Um, and also so waist and hip shaping. So I did decreases down to my natural waist and then increases out over my hip until I had gotten back to the original stitch count that I had before I did any of the shaping, if that makes sense. So the other modification I made was I steeped the skirt. So in the pattern, she has you get to the part where you create the slits and then just knit um, flat, um, you know, knit and purl. But I was not interested in doing that. I really enjoy knitting in the round. <laughs> So what I did was I created a little sticking column here and then I just folded it over and sewed it down. So I actually did begin, you can see there, I begun originally with knitting backwards and forwards and then I got sick of it. So then create a sticking column, cut it open. And then for the hem, she was gonna have you do a similar thing where you fold the edges down. However, I, I found that it left a really obvious line down here. Whereas for the skirt, I mean, it's pretty seamless. You can't really see where I've sewn it. But here, it was super duper obvious and I really didn't like it. So I tried a few different things. I tried just doing a regular bind off, but I forgot how much stockinette wants to curl when you do that. I then tried something else that also didn't work very well. So what I ended up doing was knitting it a little bit longer binding off and then well as the bind off I did like a three needle bind off so I picked up a stitch from here and then knit that together with the bound off section along there it was a bit weird I didn't know how it was going to work but I mean I think it worked pretty well you know it it's pretty seamless you can't really see I mean there's a bit of a, a line like it almost like a hem but it worked really well it stopped it from from flaring back up and curling on itself the other thing I found, which is kind of funny with this, was uh, it's, a, it's a yoke style dress. <laughs> so you increase along the yoke. And in the pattern, she has you do um, like knit through the front and back loop of one of the stitches to, to increase. And I don't usually do those kind of increases. And I found that when I did it, it almost created like a kind of pearl bump. So I don't know if I was doing something wrong or whatever it was, but what I ended up doing was dropping down to where I had the increase and doing like a kind of sweater surgery thing on it to change the positioning of the pearl bump. I've got some footage of it. I'll put it in if I can find it. Um, but it ended up being pretty seamless. I mean, you can sort of still see kind of where the increases are along the, the yoke, but I think it worked out quite well in the end. So yeah, that is my academia dress. It is unbelievably beautiful and I cannot wait until it's winter time so I can wear it because it is just so stunning. Oh, yeah. I haven't yet put buttons on the back um, to button up the neck. However, if you didn't notice, I did do it on both the cardigans. So last year I was joking about how I never put buttons on any of my cardigans because I just find it really difficult, but I have done it. Not that I find attaching the button difficult. I find it difficult to find the right button. And then it's like, I'm no I don't do it till I've sort of finished the garment. And anyway, I've mostly improved my habit. This is the exception where I haven't, but that's me and buttons. If the frame has changed, apologies. The battery died. I may need to do this again. Um, my camera's battery seems to have been getting worse and worse as time goes by, but we'll just make do. The next category we're going to talk about is tops. So the first one is the Crocus top by Lena Tosti. Tosti? Tosti? I'm not sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it is a beautiful lace yoke top. It's knit in um, plant-based fibers. So mine, I used Rowan Creative Linen, which is a 50-50 blend, I'm pretty sure, of cotton and linen in just a plain white colorway. 
And this top comes with several different variations. So you have your size that you knit, but then within that you can also knit it in different variations of how fitted you want it to be. So I knit mine very fitted. I actually also cropped it. The original is meant to be hip length, but I love everything cropped and um, I was kidding myself to think I was gonna knit a full length garment. But it is beautiful and so, so lovely. Very easy to follow. There was one part in the pattern that I was a little unsure about, um, which is essentially to do with how you need to move your stitch marker to stay in pattern. It was a little unclear, but I think once it clicked, it was very straightforward. It was also my first time knitting lace darts along the bust, which were really beautiful. I usually do uh, waist decreases or waist shaping along the sides by doing, similar to how you do a, the toe of a sock, so by doing a knit two together and then knitting one stitch and then a SSK is normally how I would do it. But instead it had you do it at the sides here, which I think is really beautiful and almost gives it sort of like a, a tailored look. And because I made it cropped, it actually ended up being a pretty thrifty project. I used just over one skein of the Rowan Creative Linen. So if I'd made it longer, obviously I would have used more, but it was quite nice to just use, you know, the one skein for it. And get a bit closer. Let's see here, that sort of like tiered lace that goes along the, the tops with little cap sleeves and then just a very simple garter bind off. I did do a Italian sewn bind off on the hem. I don't know, I think with plant-based fibers it doesn't really have the same benefit that it does with wool. I would probably, if I were to do this again, I would just do a regular um, long tail bind off or just the regular bind off. I don't think it really benefited from doing the Italian sewn bind off. Now the next top I'm gonna show, you're gonna be very, very familiar with. I think everyone has knitted one. It's the Camisole Number no. 2 by My Favorite Things Knitwear. In this light, it actually looks kind of sheer. It's definitely not sheer. I knit it in the Knitting for Olive uh, Pure Silk, which is so beautiful. I did it in the Plum Rose color. Okay. Which is looking a bit orange on screen, but it's definitely got much more of a, it's definitely a sort of burnt brown with some sort of mauvey pink undertones to it. Really, really beautiful. The silk is, it's an interesting texture and it's actually quite cool on the hands to knit. It's not as harsh on your hands to knit as cotton or linen. I found it much softer. It obviously doesn't have the elasticity that wool does, but it's very, very enjoyable to knit with. It has a lot of drape and this definitely grows. Um, the straps have been good. I made them extra, I made them shorter than I probably should have, or rather the pattern probably suggested just because I knew that there would be a bit of give. This does grow with wear, but I find once I, you know, block it or if I wet it, it does shrink back in again. I made mine perhaps a little bit more cropped than the pattern suggested, um, but I didn't do it cropped cropped because I wanted it to have, to be able to, to be tucked into jeans without popping out. I did do waist shaping along the side, which you'll see here. I'll also show it a bit more clearly in the try on, but I did waist shaping at the side just to give it a bit more structure because I had knit this before. I actually knit it, I bought this pattern years ago and I knit it up in a wool and I was sort of a beginner and I, it was knit on three millimeter needles and it's a lot of ribbing and I wasn't really prepared for that, I think. And I found it really disheartening because there's no shaping from the hip to the bust. And as a beginner, I didn't really know how to adjust patterns for my own body. And it was way too tight on the hip and then it was baggy at the waist and I just didn't like the fit and I got really disheartened by the amount of ribbing and I ended up just ripping it out and I didn't touch it again for years. But I bought this yarn when I was in Latvia from Greta Nitz, which I would highly recommend. I'll link her store below. Loveliest woman. She specializes a lot in shopper wool and, uh, if that's how you pronounce it, <laughs> and um, knitting for olive. She has an Etsy store so you can order on, uh, online there. She ships internationally. But yeah, so because I picked up, this, picked up this Knitting for Olive Pure Silk, I want to do a summer top with it. I had this in my library. I'm so happy I revisited it because I really love it and I would definitely knit more. Um, I would say a pretty straightforward pattern to knit. Um, there was nothing I ever found any difficulty with. The only thing is it's not the most size inclusive. I believe it only comes in five sizes maybe? Extra small to extra large, something like that. 
So that is one thing I will say, it's not the most size inclusive, but because it's a fairly simple pattern, I do think um, any sort of experienced knitter would be able to adjust it to their size to grade it up or down as needed. Um, but yeah, very beautiful, great summer top. I've worn it so much um, and I highly recommend it. Battery's getting low, so I'm gonna have to speed through these. The next section is on shawls. The first one I'll speak about is the Moody Fairy Shawl, which I spoke pretty thoroughly about on my channel. Uh, I have quite a few videos where this is featured in. So the design is by Malia Mae Joseph. It's a one size pattern. Uh, it's knit on four millimeter needles and uses four different colors of uh, fingering weight, uh, I think 100 gram skeins. So it was a pretty big uh, undertaking. It took me probably about four months to knit and I used up all those skeins in full pretty much. Um, but I did find it, it was really enjoyable. Uh, it was my first shawl. I wasn't prepared for how slow your progress gets once your stitch count just gets higher and higher and higher. I think by the end I had over 700 stitches um, when I did the I-cord bind off, which from memory took me about six months, six months, it felt like six months, six hours to bind off. It was a real ordeal. I can say the pattern is very well written. I did have one issue with it where the cables ended up looking really funky and I couldn't work out why. And it just turns out I didn't read the abbreviation list correctly and they're actually meant to look like this. So once I read it, it was very straightforward. I do think there was something a little bit off with the stitch count, however, in the pattern. I feel like with this, there was like a one stitch that was not right, as in, she didn't account for you having one extra stitch, like maybe you needed 365 and she had it down for 364 or something like that. Um, and I don't know if that was just my stitch count being off, but there was something about it that felt like it wasn't my stitch count, that it was something wrong with the pattern. But I don't want to throw any shade. It was probably me. It was probably me, let's be honest. Yeah, I don't really know what else to say about it. It was inspired by my rag dolls, which is why I've gone with this sort of bright blue and um, the cream and the the sort of beige um, reminds me of my ragdoll. So that's my sort of ragdoll shawl. And I've gotten a lot of wear out of it. I actually took it with me to Europe. Even though I was going in summer, it makes an excellent like pillow when you're on the plane, as well as when it's, um, it's obviously very air conditioned so it can get quite cold. I think shawls are fantastic. They're way better than those like weird airplane, airport neck pillows. Go to the shawl next time you're traveling. Uh, Multifunctional. Highly recommend. So the next shawl I did was the Shawlography by Stephen West. I was a little bit late to the MCAL. I mean, it wasn't an MCAL by the time I got to it. It had been out for, I think, almost a year. But I did it as a gift knit for my mother. So when she came down to visit me, we went to a local yarn store and she picked out her colors that she wanted. She went with this beautiful sort of uh, wine red, like a sage green, a kind of stone color, a pure white, and then this sort of like, I don't even know what you call that kind of blue. I'll put a footage of it um, in here because I don't have the shawl with me anymore. But it is a stunning piece. It was so much fun to knit. It was probably the most fun I've ever had with a knit. Um, it was just really engaging and it changed it up a lot. And also those videos that Stephen West posted on YouTube that walks you through the entire pattern are incredible. I'm pretty sure that's the full pattern that he goes through. Like, I don't think he hides anything about stitch count or anything. And just the generosity of not only the time it would have taken him to film that video, but then to put your like intellectual property up there essentially for free, even though it's a paid pattern, I think is just unbelievably generous because I found those videos so helpful. Cause there was times where it's not that the pattern wasn't well written, but there's just some things that I think are so hard to explain in words that when you just see someone do it, it's like, oh, okay, I understand what you mean by that. And those videos were so helpful in doing that. So what a sweetheart. I think that's so wonderful um, that he put those videos out. Oh yeah, I did make one small boo-boo at the start where it was with the German short rows. I forgot to knit one extra panel, which as a result then threw my entire stitch count off for the rest of the garment. But what I loved about it is that even in the videos he was saying it, like, if you make a mistake, just like fix it, whatever, like just go with it, it's fine. And I really had that approach to it of just like, oh, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rip back to it. You know, it was too far gone once I'd realized. And it was fun just sort of 
playing with it and just going with the flow and it was very easy to accommodate. Uh, it just meant that I was maybe five stitches down um, and most of the things had a five stitch repeat or something to that effect. So it was really easy to accommodate. I cannot recommend Sholography enough. It was so much fun. The videos that he puts out, like I said, have made it so easy to follow. So if anything's unclear, just go to those and, um, and it should be pretty straightforward to follow. Amazing pattern. Thank you, Stephen. Loved, loved, loved it. So the last shawl I'll speak about was this cute little kind of shawlette. <laughs> and the reason I knit this was actually because I wanted to use the yarn. I'd bought it from a, um, not super local. I mean, it was an Australian company, but they're based in Melbourne and I'm in Sydney. And the yarn is actually a New Zealand yarn. It's Bohemia Worsted by Outlaw Yarns. It's down as a worsted weight, but it's actually going to be closer to a, a heavier DK. And it's a beautiful blend of, sh I think, Polworth sheep, or Polworth wool, <laughs> alpaca, and possum. So it is super, super soft. And I just ordered one cake of it because I didn't know what I wanted to make with it. Well, I wanted to make a sweater with it, but I wanted to test the yarn first. I didn't want to buy a whole sweater's quantity and it arrive and I would hate it. So I had this one cake sitting and I thought, well, I need to use something. So I went on Ravelry, you know, did the whole, you know, search for free patterns, shawls that used within this amount of yardage. And I came across this one, which is, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce this, Sogen Fritokel <laughs> by Indie Blumst. <laughs> I will write it. That's probably absolutely butchered, but it was a free shawl pattern. You get it by just signing up to her newsletter and very simple repeat. It was so much fun to knit. And I think I knit it on four millimeter needles, which was a size up than what she recommended. But it took me two days to do this. Uh, very quick and easy. And I was like, I was spending two days solely knitting this. It was just, you know, bit by bit. It was really fun, a really cute pattern. It's nice to have these sort of like garter, um, just like garter stitch here in between some ribbing. It kind of keeps it fun, really easy. And you could scale this up to be as big or as small as you wanted. That was the other thing I learned with this one. So with this one, so they have you do a, another uh, I-cord bind off for the edging. It was a pearl I-cord bind off actually, which I've never done before. I've only ever done knit stitch pearl bind offs. But what it taught me was the first time I tried to do the bind off, I ran out of yarn. And I've never actually known how much yarn to leave for when I do um, I-cord bind offs. I kind of just would wing it and hope it would turn out okay. And it turns out you need 14 times the length that you're binding off for an I-cord. So this pattern taught me about that. But yeah, really fun, quick, easy knit. Highly recommend, really enjoyed it. So the next section I'll get into is socks. And I'm not really a huge sock knitter. I keep trying to, but as I mentioned, stocking it in the round, I just, I find it really demotivating. I will like knit it for 10 minutes and just be like, oh God, I hate this. Especially with a small diameter with a sock, there's just something about it that for some reason it feels like they take me forever. But when I actually sit down and dedicate time to knitting socks, I knock them out really quickly. So I don't know why I still have that perception in my mind that it takes me a long time. But regardless, these were the first socks I knit this year and they are a self-drafted pattern, kind of. They're very heavily inspired by a pattern by, let me read this, Lumi Kamasita. I believe she's a Norwegian designer. The original pattern is called Kitty Cats uh, or Kissimriti, something like that. Super cute. I pretty much followed the entire pattern to, well, I just took inspiration very heavily from it. I'll put a photo in, you'll see. They look almost identical. The difference was I created an image of one of our cat's faces. His name's Appa. He loves my boyfriend more than anything else in the world. I think to him, to the cat, my boyfriend is a gift from God. So for his birthday, for my boyfriend's birthday, I gave him these um, socks that have his face on it. I don't know what to say. I'm super proud. I'm so happy with how they turned out. I couldn't believe how well the resemblance actually matches our cat upper. So really happy with it. It's gonna be a long story to explain how I did this. It pretty much involved my favorite Microsoft program ever, Excel. <laughs> it was a mix of Excel and Photoshop, but I got there in the end. And yeah, they're my upper socks. But as I've mentioned, my batteries died quite a few times. I'm really running low on time. <laughs> so I will speed this up. Um, as for other socks, I knit these. They are just a plain vanilla sock, nothing special. 
they were knit um, with the Regia design line by Arnie and Carlos, I'm pretty sure. Um, nothing special to say. They are a heavier weight. They're, I think, a six ply, so closer to a, between a sport and a DK. And just a cute little pair just to get through. So I've just got to use up stock yarn because I've got it in my stash. I'm not going to use it. What am I going to do? I also need a pair of Christmas socks for my boyfriend's father this year, but I didn't really get a photo of them, so I can't share them. But they were also a Regia um, Christmas edition sock yarn that I'll link below if you're interested. As I was packing everything up, I realized I also forgot about these socks that I knit, which, I mean, the pattern is nothing special. It was just essentially a basic sock recipe that I just made myself. Uh, it was just a two by two rib for the body or for the, is that the body of the sock? I feel like it's not the right word, but the right word's not coming to me. So for the leg body of the sock, I did a two by two rib. Um, and then for the cuff, I just did one by one. And I did do a tubular cast on, but that's what I tend to do for most of my socks. Um, just because I find a long tail cast on is always a little bit too tight around the cuff. And I've tried doing, I think, is it Earth Tones Girl has done a video about how to do a, the correct way of doing a long tail cast on for your socks, which is essentially just making sure the stitches aren't packed right next to each other. I'll link it below. I tried following her thing and it's, it's very clear, but the thing is I find it difficult to get consistency in spreading those stitches in a way that I can replicate for each of my socks. Every time I do it, I feel like the cuff, the diameter of it or the, the circumference or just the kind of gauge of it is not consistent. Whereas I find if I at least do a tubular cast on in the round, it gives me enough stretch, but also with enough consistency that I can replicate it and the socks will always be the same width. I feel like I've used diameter, circumference, width, whatever, you know what I mean. But the special thing about these is not the pattern, it's the yarn. And I got it from Etsy. It's a 80-20 blend of wool and dog fur made from Ofchaka. I did a video about them. It was not the most pleasant to knit with because I chose the wrong project. Uh, it's probably, a, I would say maybe a DK weight yarn and I knit these on two millimeter needles because I want it to be super dense. And that's why it was a poor choice. Uh, it was just such a struggle. It was a real fight to like, fight to knit it. Like it, it was, it was difficult. Struggle, that's what I mean. It was a struggle to knit. Particularly when I did the uh, heels, I did a German short row heel and doing those short rows with such coarse yarn on such fine needles was a real struggle, but I got through it and um, they're super warm. They're actually a lot, the yarn feels quite scratchy, but when it's on your feet, I was surprised actually how not irritating it is. So I've got a lot of this wool. I don't know what I'm going to use with it, but I had to do something. So I made these socks. Um, but yeah, I totally forgot about these until I was packing away all the knits. And then I found these and was like, wait a minute, I didn't even talk about these. So they're my Caucasian mountain dog socks. Pretty special, I think. So the last two items I'll show are my two iterations of the Honey Clutch by Petite Knit. And the first one I did show on the channel and I knit it in the Biche Bouche Le Gros mohair and silk, something like that. Um, mistakenly thinking it was the Le Petit mohair and silk. This version is actually, I believe it's a worsted weight. Um, however, the uh, gauge turned out to be perfect. So, and I think from memory, I used pretty much one skein and that was it perfectly. So if you are looking to knit the honey clutch, maybe think about that. It could be good just as like a one skein wonder kind of a project, but I really enjoyed knitting this. It's so cute. Um, I lined it with this beautiful fabric I got on Etsy from a Polish seller. Do have some things in there. I took this to me um, when I was traveling overseas, so it's got some receipts and stuff like that that I haven't thrown out yet. Um, I did use the petite knit zipper as well that she sells in her store. They're really cute. I mean, it's hard not to not to use that. Now, when I did this first one, I made a couple of teeny tiny little errors. I think there was something. It's sort of hard to see it now. Something along the bottom here, maybe, when I was doing the honeycomb brioche and I just got a little confused and I just made that little tiny boo-boo. And so I thought, you know what, when I do the second version, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do it perfectly, it'll be seamless. 
However, with this, you knit it with two DPNs at the end, and then on the sides, you use a circular needle. So you've got four needles going. And one morning I was really tired and I was knitting on it and I wasn't thinking, and I started using the DPN to go along this edge. And instinctively, once I finished it, I yanked the DPN out thinking that it was a circular and pulling the cord through. And obviously I just lost all my live stitches. So I was able to get them back on. I'm pretty sure it was on this side it happened. It's, I was able to pick them up pretty well, which I'm pretty happy about considering it's brioche. I haven't yet sewn the lining in and I think on the inside you can see, there we go, that line that goes across it where I did it. Whereas on the other side, it's fine. So one tiny little boo-boo, but for the most part, um, it went well. I love the Honey Clutch pattern by Petite Knit. I would highly recommend anyone to make them. It's a lot of fun. They knit it quite quickly. I think they would make wonderful gifts and they're just so cute. And I mean, I found that I've used this quite a lot. So they are still quite practical. And I mean, they'd be great for makeup or if you want to store any knitting things in there, it's like a little notions pouch. I think that would be really cute. And the pattern, although, I mean, it is recommended for advanced knitters, I think an adventurous intermediate could absolutely tackle this. And it's a lot of fun. So if I haven't already said that, it was fun. Oh, and for anyone interested, what I'm wearing, um, I showed this in my last year's Everything I Knit in 2021 video. It's the Boardwalk Blouse by Poison Girls. It's knit in a four ply, um, Pop by yarn, but it's by a brand called Haiku. I think it's called Kobasi. It's essentially meant to be a vegan or a non-wool sock yarn. So it's got a lot of elasticity and it's a blend of silk, bamboo, cotton, and nylon. Um, and it's wonderful. I really, really like it. Fantastic for summer. This pattern is amazing. I've knit two of them. I would knit more. I'm actually currently working on another Poison Girls um, pattern at the moment. I love them. So that's what I'm wearing. So that's pretty much everything I knit in 2022. I'm gonna have to wrap this up pretty quickly because my camera battery keeps dying and I keep doing these like mini little charges just to get it through. And this is probably like the fifth time I've had to record uh, something. So I think we'll just cut it there. Thank you so much for stopping by. I apologize for any returning viewers again about the long hiatus. I'm hoping this year to be publishing things a little bit more regularly. Obviously six months is a long time off, but thank you for bearing with me. It's lovely to see any returning faces and for anyone new, thank you so much for joining me and I will speak to you very soon. Take care, bye.